Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure, uh, well, to continue our um, series this afternoon, uh, the fifth in our seven part series in, uh, I'm sorry, this is the fourth of our seven part series um, entitled Architecture in Civic Service, uh, where we're examining the administrative roles played by architects uh, in designing uh, various uh, cities from, 19, from the 19th century uh, to uh, uh, the post-war period. Uh, and then eventually we will end with two contemporary examples. The last three lectures in the series have focused on the 19th century modern metropoli of Berlin, Barcelona, and Vienna. And today, uh, it's a pleasure to have Linda Flasenrode uh, uh, to present, to take us into the post-war period, into, uh, well, post-war Amsterdam, to tell us the story of Jacoba Mulder, um, one of the first women to graduate uh, from uh, what eventually became known as the TU Delft, where we are today. Um, in particular, uh, her lecture, well, will focus on her contribution to uh, designing Amsterdam, where she um, was part of the team um, and then eventual head uh, for the um, uh, greater expansion of Rotterdam. After the Second World War, she developed and elaborated the layout of sub plans as part of uh, the planning department's uh, as being taking on the lead role as the planning department's um, chief architect. She steered uh, uh, and worked through many committees uh, uh, inside the Department of Public Works uh, at various to achieve projects of various different scales. Um, and in the end, uh, toward the end of her career, she, uh, Jokoba Mulder, uh, ran the urban planning department um, uh, from 1958 to 1966, which I think is, uh, well, for me, 1966 is always um, an interesting year in architectural periodization because so many books and theories of uh, the contemporary city that we still look at were published. Um, at that moment. Um, at any rate, in uh, Linda's lecture today, she will focus on the complexity of post-war production through Jacoba Mulder's uh, humanistic perspective. Um, it's a pleasure to have Linda uh, do this lecture. This is a uh, work in progress. She is doing a, a long-term, completing a long-term research project on the work of uh, Jacoba Mulder. Uh, uh, the first such comprehensive study, a very important study. Linda is uh, an independent curator um, and she was formerly uh, the chief curator at what was uh, uh, once known as the Netherlands Architecture Institute, which transformed itself um, uh, into the new institute around 10 years ago. Um, Linda's project on Jokoba Mulder is uh, funded by uh, the Creative Industries Fund, the City of Amsterdam's Planning and Sustainability um, Department, as well as um, the City's Department of uh, Monuments and Archaeology. Again, I would like to uh, thank you, Linda, for accepting the invitation to um, contribute a uh, Dutch story to uh, this broader lecture series and to um, uh, share this work in progress under, you know, um, uh, uh, are, let's say, thematic, uh, and it's always, um, uh, well, it's great that you're willing to do this, um, especially when um, in these times, uh, we're not always so eager to maybe share ideas that are in works while we try to kind of uh, situate our uh, narratives and things like this. So at any rate, um, thank you for accepting the offer, and we look forward to hearing the story of Jacopo Mola, uh this afternoon. Thank you. The screen is now yours. Okay, thank you, Solomon, for your uh, introduction and obviously for the invitation to join you with this lecture, which is uh, indeed work in progress. Uh, I'm not doing this uh, research full time, and due to the Corona crisis, I was confronted with some delay, which is frustrating uh, to a certain degree. But um, anyway, this year I hope to make some new steps also in the research itself. Um, I'm going to share the screen with you. 
and hope it works out the way it was planned. Yes. So I'm going to talk about uh, Jacoba Mulder um, and the research in itself um, sits in a period where we have a sort of growing interest in the role that women play in our, say, our, our architecture history. Um, so here are some books that were being published um, uh, over the last few years. Charlotte Perriand on interior architecture who used to work with Le Corbusier, uh, for instance, but also Lotte Stambese, an urban planner working for the city of Rotterdam, which had a sort of similar position like um, uh, Jacoba Mulder, but also like a, a, a documentary, very interesting one that was released several years ago on four uh, Canadian uh, architects and landscape architects. Um, uh, they're all still alive. And I think Denise Scott Brown is, is one of the most famous or the most well-known person in this list. Um, of course, it's it's very interesting to see uh, this, this growing attention for, for uh, women in architecture history. What becomes clear also here is that most of them um, are uh, architects, which is uh, a lot more sexy than urban planning, or at least to to, to dive into that subject. Uh, and also most of them are running their own office uh, uh, independently. And uh, that makes it easier to track down their sort of legacy or um, say authorship. And that is quite different with Jacoba Mulder. Here she um, is um, 65. This is the day she retires, um, standing in front of a map of the city of Amsterdam where she spent most of her working career. Um, and in the period that she worked for Amsterdam, this, the city more or less doubled in size. Um, however, she was part of the urban planning department that was part of public works. And um, indeed authorship and legacy is a little bit more difficult to trace. Um, how to introduce her because um, who was she? Uh, Solomon already mentioned a few things. Um, one of the key uh, elements, of course, is that she was one of the first female architects that graduated from Delft in 1926. And it took her several years to find a job uh, because um, at that time, uh, quite some offices thought it was inappropriate to hire a female architect. Um, however, through some steps, she uh, manages to arrive at the urban planning department in Delft in 1928 to work on this regional south regional plan, South Holland West, uh, which is basically the area between Rotterdam, The Hague and Delft. And because of that experience, um, when they were looking for someone to assist Van Eesteren in the urban planning department in Amsterdam, um, uh, based on that experience, she was accepted for the job because she had experience that was rare at the time. I mean, urban planning was a whole new profession. And um, so not that many people were experienced in that way. So she um, started to work in 1930 and spent basically the rest of her career working for the city of Amsterdam. In 1952, uh, she succeeds Van Eesteren as head of design at the planning department. And then in 1958, she succeeds him as head of the urban planning department. In 65, she retires and then becomes, she, she becomes extraordinary professor at the planning department of the University of Amsterdam, where she starts teaching very practical and technical problems in, in urban planning. Um, this is a way of sort of the, the formal way to introduce her. There is also another way, which is a, a bit more informal, which is through this portrait. Uh, of her that was painted by Willem den Oude in 1970, 1971. And I talked to him uh, a few years ago. Uh, he was already very old, but still very sharp. And he could remember very well how he, how he got to know her. And this was a commission uh, by the city of Amsterdam. Every year they would select someone to be painted who had been important for the city. And in 1970, it was Jacoba Mulder. And she chose him to be the one to paint her. Um, and um, he said, when I was talking to her, she was a very modest, uh, friendly person, but didn't say one word too many. And um, through the conversation she had with her, he said it was very clear that the work was much more important than the person. She was already 70, but still at work. So he thought that was remarkable too. But he said um, she almost disappeared in the work and that is how I painted her. Uh, so what you see here also in the painting is that you can basically hardly see her face, but she is working. She is surrounded by her most important projects, including the Amsterdam Forest, the Beatrix Park, the layout of Frankendal, but you can hardly see her. And that disappearing in the work, I find that very fascinating and it's basically, I mean, I, it's the title of the research at this point. Uh, and I think the disappearing is, is, is relevant in three different layers. Um, so one is on the person itself, 
as she was a modest person, extremely private, hardly anyone knew uh, about, her, about her private life, um, very loyal to the team, very loyal to the city of Amsterdam. She has thrown away her whole archive. There are no, uh, no images, no photographs, no diaries, no letters, because apparently she thought it was not um, appropriate or important enough. The second layer is authorship, as she was part of the city uh, uh, urban planning uh, department. She said, you know, taking that step, she once mentioned in an interview much later, I knew I was becoming anonymous. Um, and uh, Cornelis van Eesteren, he, he really <laughs> thought authorship was important, but basically he was quite an exception as all it was part of a sort of collaborative effort. And thirdly, I think it is the position of, of critics and journalists and historians to actually um, that we are now trying finally uh, to bring in more knowledge on the role uh, women played in, in shaping our cities and, 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 and our urban buildings. Um, so I got to know her through um, a, a Better City, uh, an exhibition I curated in 2017 in the city archives um, that was partly based on a book called The Nieuwe Grachtengordel, a literal translation that would be the New Canal District, um, that was published in 2017 and that really was looking into the execution of the Amsterdam expansion plan. And one of the major uh, conclusions was that Jacoba Mulder played a much more important role in the execution of that plan that generally had been considered. And I was a bit surprised because basically uh, the only publication that has appeared about her work was published in 1994 uh, by Ella van Kessel and Frau Kipalstra, which was uh, greatly, well, was most importantly um, uh, based on some newspaper articles and articles that she wrote, but no extensive research in the archives. So that's what I've, that's where I started basically from that last uh, point. Uh, um, and of course, the Nieuwe Grachtengordel as, as a point of reference. Uh, for me, this is a, an important guideline. It's a quote uh, from Beatrice Colomina from 2018, where she says, uh, women are the ghosts of modern architecture everywhere present, crucial but strangely invisible. Unacknowledged, they are destined to haunt the field forever. But correcting the record is not just a question of adding a few names or even hundreds to the history of architecture, nor a matter of human justice or historical accuracy, but of opening the field to its own productive complexity. And especially those two final words, productive complexity, that is what I find interesting. It is not my intention to put her on a pedestal um, and, and bring in a sort of new type of genius because I think we have been focusing on that way too long. It's more about what is the complexity of the production inside uh, a city government, um, within that time frame, within these gender issues, um, what does this collaborative effort take shape and what was her contribution to that? in order to shape Dutch um, urban planning and landscape architecture. So that is sort of my point of departure. Um, this general um, expansion plan uh, obviously uh, um, uh, plays a key role. Uh, this is a map. This was the one that uh, was used to present the plan. It was um, uh, presented in 1935 um, uh, to actually uh, uh, predict or to, to, to uh, display uh, how the, the city of Amsterdam, how it would grow in the future. Because in 1921, basically the land expanded, uh, it doubled more or less, and they really needed a plan to see how it could grow in the future. It was a clear example of a functional city. So a clear distinction between working, living, um, uh, uh, recreation and traffic. And it had this ideal to sort of empower uh, all layers of society, but especially uh, the working class uh, um, uh, um, uh, in society by uh, providing them an, an, an extension of the city with a lot of green, with a lot of light and a lot of air, so that everybody would be in the green with only just a few minutes uh, in time. Um, it was also based on a lot of research, and this is one of those beautiful images that, um, uh, I mean, the design was steered by, van by uh, Cornelis van Eesteren, but the research was steered by uh, Theodor van Lohuizen, and he did some quite experimental research. These are, uh, was done in 1930, where 1400 students or school children were positioned on 250 spots in the city to actually calculate the traffic. So how many people would use the bus, how many people would walk, how many people 
people would cycle in order to predict the importance or say the, the how traffic would steer the growth of the city. Of course, they also did calculations on the population growth and the economic growth. And based on that, it was a plan aiming for 960,000 people in the year 2000. Um, the plan in itself, of course, is part of the discourse on the functional city. This is an image taken at the fourth Congress of Siam in 1933, which was taking place on a cruise ship. Le Corbusier is standing here in front of the maps of, of Amsterdam. Uh, Van Eester was at that time chairman of Siam. And uh, this Congress was an important one as for the first time, all the attendee, uh, the, the people who joined were looking at 34 plans of 40, 34 different cities um, where specifically um, maps were being made in order to be able to compare them and having a discourse on what the functional city should look like and how it how it should be. So it was an exercise in mapping and also an exercise, of course, in that discourse. Um, it turned out to become a, an exhibition in, um, in Amsterdam in 1935. And that's also the moment that also Van Eestrum presents it to the delegates of Siam. Um, so the, the, the plan in itself uh, um, uh, gained a lot of recognition and a lot of fame already from the start. However, in order to um, put that vision into practice, you also need certain talents. And uh, especially when you're knowing that this is a, an image of 1932, where you can see that it was very rough plan in terms of volumes on, on where to build specific um, um, architecture. But of course, it, to put it into practice um, and to put it into a coherent, to put it into practice coherently in order to meet your ambitions is another um, uh, challenge. And that is, of course, what the Nieuwe Grachtengolle was trying to uh, figure out. And that's also where um, Jacoba Mulder comes in as um, the one who played an important role or a key role in doing that. So for me, um, the institutional framework um, is, is, is important. So basically, who is doing what and why? Uh, this is a photograph taken in 1932, as it is someone who is, um, uh, uh, is, is retiring. Uh, but you can see here, can you see my mouse, by the way? Uh, the moving. Okay. Um, so uh, this is um, Scheffer, who's actually running the department. You can see Cornelis van Eestren here, and then a very shy looking Jacoba Mulder here at the side. Um, it started off as a really small team um, to actually work on that expansion plan. And the reason why I'm showing you this is that it is just one year before she actually gets a permanent contract. The reason why I'm saying this is that it's quite remarkable because uh, we are in the middle of the economic crisis and a lot of female architects and urban planners are being fired in order to give room to the men in order to, uh, to fulfill their job and to provide money for their families. However, um, and this is what I found also in the files of the human resources department, um, uh, Schäffer makes a very strong plea to keep Mulder and also five people from the drawing room as he explains how difficult it was to find talented people in order to give shape to new visions on urban planning and that they actually well it was difficult to find people but also that they have been training them on the ground um, so he makes a strong plea saying i i i i uh, i don't mind to keep my my team very small i mean we're overloaded with work but uh, let's keep it small as long as we can we can uh, keep these people on board this is a, a chart of public works in 1950. Um, obviously, the team gr uh, grew uh, quite rapidly after the war in order to give shape uh, to the expansion plan. And what you can see here, I mean, it's um, I think it's quite an overwhelming chart as, as it, it's, it's, it's very extensive. Of course, the director in the middle, uh, the urban planning department sits, sits here, but um, you had departments for buildings, for grain, for streets, for bridges. And then you also still have also had a city architect who also had a role to play. So it was a very hierarchical system um, um, where, of course, the, the urban planning department was um, uh, important for the initial stages in order to write down uh, the, the plans or to draw the plans, to be honest. But of course, when we talk about the execution, they all had to collaborate in order to make this happening in terms of the different levels of, of interaction. Um, and then uh, in addition to that, uh, they had to work with the housing corporations, the supervisors, the architects in order to make all of this uh, happening. So that's the complexity that I was referring to you about earlier in order to make this work. 
Um, just an image when Scheffer departs in 1952. Uh, this is the moment when Van Eesteren uh, uh, becomes his successor and uh, Mulder uh, becomes head of design. From the same human resources department, it becomes clear, however, that after the war, she had a, a, a more autonomous role. In that regard, that she was replacing Van Eesteren uh, many times, but also replacing Scheffer as he was dealing with a bad health after the war. Um, so that her role was um, uh, bigger than indeed uh, we have assumed for a very long period of time. Um, so that she had was really trying to steer and replacing people leading the department, uh, especially um, after in say the end 40s and early 50s. Um, a graph of the urban planning department in 1954, just as a reference, you can see head of the department is Cornelis van Eesteren. You had the department of survey, they all did the research. Then you had the department of traffic, which was a growing um, subject. It was a problematic issue um, that they really wanted to solve. Uh, and I think the Belma Mir is a clear example about how the, the new steps they wanted to take. This is more about eternal affairs. And then this is the design department head by Mulder, which is focusing on the expansion plans. So the, the, the post-war neighborhoods, um, large scale um, subjects like for instance, the implementation of university in the inner city and the redevelopment of the 19th century neighborhoods that were in a very poor shape um, after the war. And as you can see here, she is the one to replace Van Eesteren the moment he was teaching in Delft, for instance, because he became professor in 1947 for two days a week or when he was abroad. So the collaboration between Mulder and Van Eesteren was extensive. She was hired as his right hand. Um, and I think, um, and that's of course part of the research is to see how, how they collaborated as um, already uh, approved uh, say by, by previous researchers that she was the one who sat next to him, replaced him, um, uh, backed him up. And um, so I think he also needed her in order to execute the grand vision as she was the one that collaborated between the different departments that was part of committees um, that worked on, on the layouts of the plans but also on the smaller details um, so in order to be executing a grand vision, uh, you also need people to, um, to work in, in the, on, the feet, on the ground, so to speak. Um, they were not a couple, but I do believe that they had a sort of unspoken rules about how they collaborated and what position uh, each of them took. Just some references about the urban planning department, so the, the, the surveying department, the traffic department, the drawing office, model building department, and as you can see, these are all men. Um, um, so it was quite exceptional as a, the role that she played. Um, in order to say something about post-war um, post period and the contributions she had, it's also good to, to dive shortly into a few things she did before the war as say between 1930 and say 1939, um, uh, 42. Um, it, it was also a way to experiment or to learn the field. Um, and then obviously we cannot ignore the Amsterdam forest. Uh, this is the final design. Um, it was an assignment that she and Van Eesten worked on since 1935. I'm not going to dive into detail into the design because it would take too much time, uh, but I'm addressing it for two reasons. Uh, first of all, um, uh, um, they got the assignment uh, in 1935 uh, while not knowing much about green. So we are talking about a huge assignment. It's still one of the largest city parks in the world. Um, but uh, with two uh, architects and urban planners who had, well, some uh, fascination for green, but, but, no, but were no landscape architects. And of course, that's quite obvious since also landscape architecture was a whole new uh, field. And um, the cities of, of Amsterdam and Rotterdam, they only started hiring landscape architects um, after the war. So the Department of Green um, obviously was not happy with the situation, but they were the, basically the ones that maintained the green and would choose uh, the type of trees and the types of bushes. But uh, Van Eesteren and Mulder, and, and Mulder specifically, as Van Eesteren was only working on, say, the, the, say the, 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 the rough guidelines, she did the majority of the work, uh, was that she was constructing the volumes and the experiences of the spaces, uh, the differences in heights. And this also comes back from the analysis of the urban planning department in collaboration with other departments is that uh, she had a sort of privileged position 
and bridging the two departments, uh, say the planning, uh, so the, the, the planning part and the green part, where she was the one to actually uh, working on shaping the urban green, which was different than from the Amsterdam forest, which was a design challenge in itself. And the constraints between these departments actually lasted until the 60s, where it was the key question, who's in charge of shaping the urban green? Is that the urban planning department or is it the green department? Um, just one image of the Amsterdam forest. As you can see here, this is um, the paddling pool. This is the pond in the corner. And this is the, the, the area where people would lay down. Uh, it's a clear uh, uh, example of, of an axis um, uh, that they wanted to create, which is one of the underlying principles of the Amsterdam forest, few points and axes. Uh, but I wanted to focus on this, this part specifically because um, whenever you walk from this side to that one, with every one meter, you go down one centimeter. And this is something that she copied from a park in Hamburg. Um, and also when she, um, uh, she has some, some, some notes about the Amsterdam forest, she said, you know, whatever uh, the importance of, the, 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 of using the differences in height, even how little they are. So um, in, in shaping these spaces into the green, um, it was for her important in order to sort of create a comforting place, but also that the people who would sit here would have a clear idea about what would happen in the paddling pool with the children. So it was, um, it is something that was very much tailor made, uh, but is very much related to this human scale that she thought was important. And um, um, apart from, you know, where the benches should be and how the paths would run, it's especially these differences in height was something that she referred to quite often. Um, she also designed the Beatrix Park. Again, as a sort of privileged position, uh, she would not design, uh, decide on the types of trees or what types of flowers to use, but really about where the different spaces should be. Um, and inside that Beatrix Park, she also designed the paddling pool. Um, it's no longer there because it had to be, uh, it was replaced in the 1960s. So there's now another version, uh, but she designed this one with a beautiful arcade alongside where people could sit down and uh, rest in the shade. Um, play also after the war was a very important subject to her, paddling pools in itself as well. Um, so it is interesting to see that this was already taking place before the war. Uh, she also worked on the extension plan of Boston Lomer, which was actually the first part that was put into execution. Just before the war, half of Boston Lomer was being built. Um, but what you see is a very rigid, a bit boring um, urban plan with a sort of similar north-south axis of the different building blocks. Um, it was the first, these were the first experiments actually with uh, building the open building block, um, uh, which was a, a key figure of the Amsterdam expansion plan. Um, so before that we had, uh, when you look at Amsterdam South, it's known because of its closed building blocks. In the 1930s, you have a group of avant-garde architects who really want to uh, step away from that um, and put the open building block into the green so that the front and the back would be equally important and would be openly accessible so that there would be enough light and enough green and air for the people living in these houses. Um, and that was quite a challenge because there were not many references. And when you talk about this open building block, you have a nice front, but also an ugly backside uh, with these private gardens and perhaps the laundry that was hanging there. So it was for many architects a struggle about how to do this sufficiently. Um, this is one of the first examples. Uh, Merkelbach and Karsten did this project in Landlust. Um, so just before the war, it was half being built uh, and, and most of the people were not really happy or satisfied with the results, especially von Eastern was not pleased with how it turned out to be. Um, and in 39, he and von Lohausen also went to Copenhagen to see how they had been doing the layouts there in order to see if they could find more well, say inspiration for diversity and variety within the positioning of these quite monotonous blocks. So that's the that's sort of the starting point of or the reference that she experienced before the war. Um, so um, uh, construction uh, was uh, uh, well was forbidden, say from forty two onwards, uh, and then there is this period of thinking basically. Um, uh, and in, um, uh, after the war, a lot of attention was being given to the reconstruction of the airport and the harbor, but there was also a huge 
housing shortage. So in 49, it is then decided that the extension plan, as it has been approved before the war, should be put into practice. Um, and it was also decided that by 1960, 50,000 homes had to be executed along these different neighborhoods, as I just put them down here. It was um, a very interesting period because um, um, neighborhood after neighborhood was being uh, designed and then being built. Um, but it was really a pressure cooker because they had to speed up um, uh, all the time and they had to cut expenses all the time. So they had to do more for less in a shorter period of time. And uh, what is interesting is that um, uh, they had to cut expenses. Um, um, uh, I'm losing the track of what I wanted to say. Uh, so they had to speed up. Oh, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. So sometimes even the poles would go into the ground while plans were not even approved yet or when they were still drawing. So there's this friction of, um, uh, of how to bring a sort of coherent story about what the expansion plan really entails, providing a green infrastructure and how that turned out to be. So the first project that uh, Mulder actually worked on is Frankendal, and that's this part. So, uh, which sits in the Watergrafsmeer, which is a, a formal polder, and it sits in between uh, Park Frankendal and the cemetery. And also here, I'm not sure if it's really, if you can see it very clearly, but this plan was approved in 39, also still a quite metonymous way of putting the different um, building blocks into the green. And um, this is um, a few images uh, taken from her uh, professional archive um, um, as they, well, it was clear before the war that they were struggling with how to position the blocks. Um, so this is um, taken from a trip uh, to Copenhagen because in 51, they went again, Van Eestre and Mulder, they also went to Stockholm. So these Scandinavian cities were a huge source of inspiration to again see how the layouts were taking place, how to bring in more variety in regard to say the connection between the building blocks and the green, but also um, they, they photographed many playgrounds, many, many, many pedaling pools, as I will show you later. Um, on this side is um, uh, a drawing or say an overview that she um, uh, used for an article, but also that she used for her teaching at the University of Amsterdam, where she actually tries to uh, explain um, uh, the transition that was being made as she uh, was finding this too um, autonomous, uh, but also in regard to the density and that when you start to reshape the configuration, um, she ended up here where you actually talk about two L-shaped blocks positioned just opposite each other, which led to um, this uh, um, um, sort of urban plan or layout for Frankendal. And what you see here is again, indeed, these L-shaped building blocks. Um, and what I wanted to show here is that the density is, is just slightly smaller than it is here. And by just showing that, she could convince her supervisors that this was a suitable plan to execute because it would bring more diversity and richness. Um, so also here, this is the plan for 49. So you see the, the, the building blocks, the, the private gardens that gradually go into the communal garden. Um, and also um, uh, what she tried to achieve was that it was open because you could cycle through it, you could walk through it. Um, uh, you can now even drive through it, um, but that um, it still is a certain feeling of unclosedness. So she was trying to find a sort of comfortable, comfortable space, even though that it could be open. And the, the, the women um, standing here in the kitchen and here from the living room could have a view onto the Gamala garden where the children could play. Um, so this is the courtyard layout where, as she writes later, was done in order to provide the residents a sort of living room outside in addition to what they already had. Um, this is how it looks um, in the 19, early 1950s, where you can see this gradual um, uh, line between the private gardens and, and, and the shared garden. This was designed by Mien Ruijs, the, the garden architect, the playground by Alder van Eyck, and then you had Merkelbach and Karsten again who did the houses. It was single family houses, That's, that was the original plan, but due to the housing shortage it became duplex houses, so it means that one family was living downstairs and the other one um, on top. And this was a model that was considered to be successful and then was being copied basically in all the other expansion plans that followed. 
um, but then not with two layers, but sometimes with four and six and higher. Of course, when you then can question if it is still a communal garden or is it a garden to watch? And that was a continuous debate also in all the other neighborhoods that followed um, where Mulder actually was a, was a, had to fight quite often also with the housing corporations who actually wanted to close this off uh, because they were afraid of the noise um, and that uh, it should be restricted. Um, so this whole notion of, of, of gardens to share uh, was something that she was a strong fighter for, but was not always that successful. And this is how it looks more or less nowadays, uh, where it is very green inside these courtyards, um, all the same height. Um, and it's now has become uh, a great deal of it has become a national monument. Um, this was just one small part of an expansion plan. Uh, work continued on Slotermere, which was then the first real large uh, neighborhood that had to be uh, implemented. Um, again, the plan of 39. Um, I cannot zoom in really, but this is again a, a quite rigid system of putting the housing blocks. Uh, when you look uh, to the next page, um, uh, it looks much more rich. That's it's this part, by the way. So, uh, which is currently uh, part of the um, Van Eester Museum. It's, it's really, a, it has a monumental status uh, where um, there is a, a, what they try to do is up to, to create much more uh, diversity in the positioning of the blocks uh, where um, uh, alongside the roads, most of the time uh, they would be higher and then the low density would be say more further into the neighborhood itself. Um, when diving into the archives and also when looking in previous research, uh, it becomes clear that um, Jacoba Mulder, like in Frankendal, uh, receives much more freedom in order to, to do the layouts of these, of these areas. And um, the story goes is that she would go home in the weekends with bags full of layouts of, of these neighborhoods and would come back on Monday morning with a lot of stickers on it in different colors, where how to position that in a in different way. And again, to see how the human eye could work within these, these neighborhoods. Uh, and this is how it looked in 1975, um, where uh, trying to find richness um, in, in, in positioning the housing blocks in different angles uh, to, to, well, to experiment at least in, in how to create more variety in something that looks quite similar. And also here you can see the courtyard layout as it was uh, presented for the first time in Frankendal. Um, Slotervaart, uh, I'm not going through all the neighborhoods because that would take too long, but Slotervaart, I think this drawing is quite uh, telling um, in that sense that it really sits into sort of green infrastructure. So, um, Green, in a way, is the glue, and that's not the, the, the nicest word to use, but it's really the glue between the buildings, it's the glue between the different neighborhoods, um, in, in that the green infrastructure still nowadays is a very is the strongest component, basically, of the expansion plan, uh, and how then the architecture sits in there. Um, um, she um, uh, worked uh, for a great deal on this plan. You see the courtyard layout, you see also try to different models uh, of bringing variety, including um, that fringe. And that's also when talking to, well, say, reading older interviews of former colleagues is that she would actually work on these specific edges uh, to create a certain, well, they would call it the, the golden fringes of these neighborhoods. And as you can see here, these are the building blocks that have been slightly moved in connection to the green volumes lying next to it. Um, and then of course, these are the courtyard layouts in, in a different, a configuration, but that she would try to, well, how to, how to mold and shape these extensions in, in a very detailed way. She also worked on the Berlagerhof in Geusefeld. Um, it might not look that exceptional, um, but it is low rise in connection to uh, the playground and the green. Um, before the war, she had this privileged position to working in between these two departments. Um, when you read the documents, say after the war, the analysis of how the urban planning department operated, it becomes clear that she was the one again to sort of uh, position the playgrounds, uh, position the um, uh, public art to um, um, work on the, the stairs and the statues and, and to see how um, that is connected to, to the green. Um, so that uh, in the relationship between, say, different types of facilities, but the green in regard to the to the urbanization process. And that's something that is quite remarkable. I would like to dive more into that. 
Uh, this is another one of those examples, Bordestein by Tefeldert. You can see uh, the Amsterdam forest and then the road connecting Amstelveen to um, uh, the southern part of Amsterdam. And she worked on that part uh, with the high rise and then the low rise and then the communal garden again. Apparently she was the one that actually was doing the shaping on, of the different heights. And this is more at eye level. And still this is work in progress, trying to find out where's the signature hand of, of Jacoba Mulder in, in shaping uh, these specific neighborhoods. Uh, playgrounds, as I mentioned already before, played a crucial role in, in her work, especially after the war. Um, uh, the story goes um, that she saw children playing in her neighborhood in the earth around the tree. So they were sort of making sand cakes, but of course, there are also dogs doing their, their thing uh, with the trees. Um, and she thought that that was problematic. Um, the expansion plan had a system. Uh, it was very profoundly uh, calculated that, that there would be playgrounds in the parks 400 meters away from each other or 800 meters away from each other, but nothing really in the vicinity of the homes. So she thought that had to be different because you had playgrounds, but these were most of the time belonging to a certain religion, to a certain religion, or you had to pay for them. Um, so it was really for them, uh, for her, it was important that these playgrounds would be publicly accessible without any fences um, and close to the home, so that a family, when they would leave the house, that there would be some a place uh, within the neighborhood. Um, and um, the first playground in that regard is the Bertelmont Plain in 1947, which was designed by Alder van Eyck. And um, uh, uh, um, I mean, the idea to execute it um, uh, was already there for a long period of time. Alder van Eyck had joined the urban planning department for a few years um, and was um, she supervised him. And he was working on the layout of a plan, but she said, you know, I went back after two days and the, and the sheet was still empty. Um, so that didn't really work out. So then she invited him to make the design for this playground. And um, so this is what uh, came out of it. It was hugely uh, successful. And then many playgrounds followed. And uh, the reason why I'm addressing this is that when we talk about uh, the playgrounds in Amsterdam, it's always about Alder van Eyck. But of course, it, when you talk about the complexity of the system, obviously there was a political will to execute hundreds of playgrounds as there was a lot of money uh, um, um, to, um, to safeguard the execution of these playgrounds, not only in the new city, as it was called, but also in the old city. Um, there was this whole system within the public works uh, to, to be able that every design would be uh, executed. Uh, there was this committee on sports fields where every playground had to be approved. Um, and there Mulder was, was part of. Um, and then there was this, this whole notion of, of, of positioning these playgrounds, which was one of the jobs that Mulder did. So it has been also a collaborative effort, a very powerful mechanism inside the public works in order to make this happen. Um, so when we talk about these playgrounds, uh, I find these beautiful images, of course, you can talk about the design, but it's also about how it sits into the green and how it sits in the neighborhood. Um, also this one, I think is just a beautiful example of how playground is related to a uh, neighborhood in itself um, as, as you can see here. And I think that has been a collaborative effort of different people who thought it was uh, an important part of, of creating a certain neighborhood. Um, this was the opening of the 205th public playground, 1961. Well, Miller is standing here as being the strongest advocate of this whole well, notion of, of how to shape society. Uh, and play was also something that is much broader. Um, she has been writing about it um, uh, a lot. She has also lectured about it uh, uh, for a very long period of time. And play here, as this was a part of an, of an article she wrote, because she becomes more and more explicit later on uh, through the different age categories, um, also gender, uh, how important it was uh, to, to have a room for play. So this is from January 1967. And all the Dutch you see here is related to play, but it was much more than only these playgrounds. It were roller skating tracks, it was paddling pools, it was uh, places for older boys to, to, to be able to play. Um, so it was much more diverse. So also that is, I think, an interesting movement inside uh, shaping the city of Amsterdam. For instance, like this island um, done by landscape architect Hans Warnau in the 60s, where actually older boys could, 
could build huts and could uh, build tents. Um, so play to her was extremely important. Uh, she wanted to, it to be publicly accessible, she said, because you know that the boundary of the city is being pushed outwards more and more. So, uh, and the homes are too small and there's a, a growing amount of traffic. So where do people, where do children play in order to sort of develop themselves? Um, so also for these playgrounds, there was this system for every 100 houses, there would be one playground. And uh, what is also quite interesting to see is that since she gave a lot of lectures and, and wrote about it, she also, uh, uh, it's like a strong plea towards the different city governments, but also smaller places to always guarantee free room in their extension plans uh, for play. Um, since she said, you know, there's no advocate for it. So when money rules, it is given away to the highest bidder and um, cities should be able to guarantee that play is, 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 is a permanent part of the development of, of the towns and, and cities. So paddling pools, as I said, for her, these were like cherries on the pie. Um, and again, I referred to it earlier, they went to Copenhagen, but also to Stockholm in 1951. These are the sort of the travel notes that she made uh, where she photographed many playgrounds, apart from the layouts that I addressed earlier, and also the paddling pools. Uh, this is at the back of one of those photographs where she actually made drawings about how that paddling pool was sitting inside the urban fabric. Um, and I think this one is the most, um, uh, I think it's a, a very beautiful example, uh, a paddling pool in Gibraltarstraat, um, actually a, a, a quite large one, 14 by 25 uh, meters, uh, tilted 60 centimeters, surrounded by hedges, so no dirt would fly in, uh, stairs along the side so that they would not cycle around the pool. There's like a, a table, a playing table in the middle and a statue there. Uh, but also when you look at it, how it sits in, in the neighborhood, I think it's a very interesting example of, of, of how she tried to shape and, and mold it um, and a very lively place as a result. A much smaller one at the Bellamy Plain in the old city, as it is called. Again, the relationship between paddling pool green, urban fabric, and then the pelling pool in the Amsterdam forest. I mean, it was very expensive to make them um, as the soil of Amsterdam is very weak. Um, therefore, um, they're not that many. Uh, she wanted many more, but that was again, too expensive. Uh, but the one in the Amsterdam forest is actually the largest one um, since the soil was there strong enough. It is a very um, modest design, but it's, it's, it's a big place with the, 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 the stepping stones. And then of course, in addition to the the area, as I explained earlier, that is growing up with this very, with this slope, uh, these differences in height that she play with, I think it's an interesting example. Um, I talked about projects, I talked about certain uh, themes that were important to her. Um, the committees uh, is another thing that I, I'm currently trying to explore because she took part of more than 40 committees, most of them inside public works, but also several of them outside of them. And uh, these committees, most of the time, uh, were compiled with different people from different uh, departments and added with several people from outside. So for instance, the committee for the new city, uh, you can compare it to the Welstandskommissie in Dutch uh, uh, nowadays, is that where all the new projects were being presented and had to be judged. And um, um, so she was, she was part of that one as soon as she became head of the urban planning department. However, she was also secretary of the committee for the old city from 1946. So that was really about pl new plans for the, 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 the old part of Amsterdam. Uh, but she was also uh, a chairwoman of the committee on recreation, a uh, committee on sports fields. So that was judging all the playgrounds, but also, um, how to say uh, the, the 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 sports parks and the and and the clubhouses, um, and so by being part of that, she was just part of a sort of system, and it feels in a way as if she was more or less a sort of spider in the web, as she was one of those people that would stay. I mean, the external people would leave after a few years, but she was the one that would actually remain part of these committees and was continuously. Um, uh, bringing in arguments. She was also the one who was the most well informed. I mean, I have not gone through all of these um, committees uh, yet, but I've, I've dived into two of them. One, for instance, is the Committee on Art Commissions. Nearly 20 years she was part of that committee uh, with a lot of assignments to uh, 
um, to artists um, to actually create uh, uh, art in public space. So mo it was a most of what you see in in Amsterdam is is originating from that time. So it was a way to sort of mold and shape and steer. But also when we talk about the committee for the new city, she was the one to inform the others because she was, well, she knew most of the detailing of these uh, areas. Uh, she was also the one uh, talking about uh, the building heights, especially in high rise. She had very strong opinions about that, but also about the fences. Um, so it, it really is from the bigger layout until the smallest detail. So um, of course you can talk about specific projects, but also this is a way of having influence and um, she was not the one with the, the biggest voice. That was not her kind of person, uh, but definitely there was a certain influence and that is something that I'm currently trying to dive into further. Um, of course, just an example, this is the, 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 the sculpture, the paddling pool, the Gibraltarstraat, where she collaborated with these artists uh, very much in detail, uh, the same one with uh, the Beatrix Park. Um, but also that she uh, made maps where the different uh, sculptures could take place. That was one of the source or say one of the, the elements that she brought in to look at it from a larger perspective. Uh, to conclude, because I think I've been talking uh, uh, way too long already, um, is the notion on, on high rise. Um, uh, why am I talking about high rise is that it comes back um, in, 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 in different ways as um, um, high rise as she had a lot of fights for instance with alderman uh, Danel, who uh, especially when she was head of the urban planning department envisioned a lot of high rise in the old city center and she was very much against that um, um, she was part of the committee on high rise low rise um, that was installed by the national government and that published a report in 1961 uh, that concluded that high rise was a very interesting topology, but only suitable for a small group of people, basically the cultural educated people. Um, those were the ones that could actually live in high rise and she, she supported that conclusion. Um, high rise was something of concern to her in regard to play. In several articles, she mentions, you know, how can high rise and play, how can that be, become something fruitful? That was something that she worried about. And of course, the Belma Mere, which was a project that was um, uh, being designed during the times that she was head of the urban planning department and, and that she felt very constrained about. She had um, uh, uh, very, uh, she was very uneased by the plans that were being developed. So um, when you look at, for instance, this image, um, high rise in the Amsterdam extension plan was actually reserved only for uh, very specific places, um, say alongside important roads or um, uh, at some specific corners or at uh, some specific places like a Slaughter Plus. It was not something at random. And um, that was in the Bellamere quite different because this was 90% high rise and 10% low rise. And that was something that was um, a concern to her. Um, Siegfried Nasut, uh, he was the uh, lead designer and of course he worked with a whole team um, on the Belmamere and um, she could not actually, um, there was a great distance between her and that new generation of young architects within her department. Being head of the urban planning department, she was sort of pushed into this managerial role. Uh, of course, she was a member of all these committees, but she also had to be a manager and that was a role that didn't really fit. Um, there is this anal an analysis of the urban planning department that was published uh, just a month before she would retire. And there it becomes clear that she works like roughly 74 hours a week. It's no exception. Um, and that, so she worked hard, <laughs> but um, um, it was clear that they wanted her to be less involved with the design and become more of a manager. Um, and you can tell um, from also the, the, the way she's working that of course, uh, the, doing the design, and I think it's something similar that happened to Van Eesteren as also that managerial role didn't really fit, um, is how that worked um, on, on shaping the smaller scales. That was something that was uh, fascinating to her and that's what she wanted to do. So. The Belmamere developed itself um, um, in a way that she could not really agree with. And um, 
the reason it was developed in such a way was that it, uh, traffic was a huge issue at the time. Um, there were a lot of accidents in traffic. And um, so this younger generation really felt that they had to solve this issue. And they could not really see a vision coming from Mulder uh, that she would work differently. So um, if you look at the design for the Belmer, you see these, these very uh, remarkable uh, shapes of, of, well, of course, it was decided along the way that there would be 11 stories high, but also in this original plan, they were put onto pillars um, and the cars were being pushed to the sides um, in these parking garages and also services so that the green landscape, also including the water, would, would be a continuous flow. So this was the area for people to walk and to cycle. So to push actually uh, traffic to the sides, also by elevated roads and of course the metro system so that it was a clearly uh, different uh, idea. Also design of the inner streets where the, the, the green would continue and this all surrounded by, um, by glass uh, so that people living in, in these high rise would meet. Uh, the houses itself had large balconies. So there was this whole, um, I mean, I'm not doing justice to the plan to describe it so shortly, but this is, um, it was an, a very ambitious plan in order to steer or shape community. Um, however, um, Jacoba Mulder was, was, uh, thought it was too uh, rigid, um, so she said, you know, it's, it's, it's too much high rise, all the apartments look the same, um, uh, you cannot, uh, when you look at society, it will not work in that way that you can fit in the whole society and all in the same types of, 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 of apartments, um, so she uh, made a, a sort of counter proposal uh, that you can see here, uh, which was done only for a small part and she pro uh, proposed 40% high rise, 50% mid rise and 10% low rise. Um, and the car would, I mean, so it's a sort of model built on what happened in Bautefeldt and the car would then still be able to go through. Um, they only did that for a small part um, um, and it could not convince. It could not convince the younger generation as uh, they felt this is business as usual. We really want to make a statement to go into another direction. It could not convince politically uh, because uh, Alderman Den Uyl, he wanted high rise uh, in, in the city center. So he thought this was too modest. Um, so also that was um, a constraint. Also the ministry of um, uh, uh, felt um, that due to, well, say I mean, the, the, the design of Nasset looked much more appropriate also in regard to the industrial way of producing. So there was a huge housing shortage. So also by doing it in an industrial way, they could really speed up the process of executing the Belma Mir. Um, so in every way, she could not convince. Um, uh, and so there was a clash of generations um, in that regard. There was respect uh, on, uh, I'll say on both sides, but um, um, she was really part of the Amsterdam expansion plan that she had been a strong fighter for um, through all, all of these years, also in trying to create a certain coherence. But uh, this was a new era and um, she was uh, unable to sort of uh, change that perspective. However, all the comments that she made on the Belmer um, in a way have become sort of true because she felt that it was too rigid. It was too monotonous. She felt that the green spaces were too big um, um, so that it would be unsafe. Uh, she had concerns in regard to play. And the most important argument she had is when they will cut expenses, how much of the plan will actually be left? And uh, that happened uh, um, quite dramatically uh, with the Belmer is that a lot of um, the extras were being cut due to cutting off expenses, uh, which led to the result um, as we know it today. Um, However, what is remarkable, and then I will conclude, is that this is the press conference of the Belma Mir in June 65. Um, so, and there she's defending a plan that she actually doesn't want to defend. So um, to the outside world, um, everything is teamwork, everything looks good, um, but inside the, the, the urban planning department, there were constraints between different generations and there were many fights going on between the planting department, the urban planning department, the housing department. So they were definitely not on the same page, but to the outside world, uh, she really was loyal um, uh, to the department and really wanted to make clear to others that it was teamwork as she has been pushing in many articles also afterwards. 
she only starts to talk about the disaster of the Belma when she's 80 or a little bit older. That's the first time she actually talks about it and says that she thought it was an extremely problematic project. Um, so to conclude, um, 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 she might not have been the, the woman with, with, with the greatest, uh, you know, the grand vision, um, but um, I, I was uh, uh, talking to one of her former students at the urban department, or say the planning department at the University of Amsterdam, um, who told me that she was actually at that time the only one who uh, made us aware of the human scale and the importance of social interaction. So um, she was the one that actually said, you know, how important it was to combine social groups, uh, but also to um, um, and, and to combine different age groups by, for instance, positioning a playground in the middle of a neighborhood, or by designing a very beautiful pond with ducks in, in the in the vicinity of an elderly home, um, and that was to them a real eye opener. So this human scale and the sociology aspect of her work, um, again, is, is quite inspirational to me. And that's what I hope to uh, investigate further along the way. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Linda, for giving a very nice outline um, of the career of Jacobo Mulder and her relationship to Amsterdam. Um, I believe there are some questions um, from uh, the audience, Nishi, you wanted to begin? Yes. Um, hi, thank you so much for the very insightful lecture. I actually had a question about the neighborhood projects that you shared with us today. Um, I was act so actually last semester, we came across these uh, cauliflower neighborhoods in Almer, and we were uh, studying how these neighborhoods are sort of wearing off today. Um, and I was, that was due to multiple reasons, but I was wondering if uh, the neighborhoods which you showed us today were land keeping in mind the future developments or did they have any vision of how they would grow with the changing environments? I see. Um, well, uh, um, there, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to answer this uh, in the best possible way. Um, Obviously, what you see uh, uh, also through the maps is that these were real blueprints. Um, and um, um, especially also when she was running the urban planning department, um, they were trying to still fill up the, the different neighborhoods. So by adding churches and by adding schools, the multitude of work was about the housing. Um, um, but then at some point it was considered to be finished. Um, so they didn't really look, uh, I would say, decades ahead as we have nowadays done <clears throat> um, in, uh, in the 90s and also the early 2000s when a lot of redevelopments have been taking place in the Amsterdam expansion plan and also still nowadays as it is considered the place to densify as there is this, I mean, you can consider the, 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 the green infrastructure. I mean, it's considered as a luxury uh, because it is, it is, it is a, a vast amount of, 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 of um, uh, of, of space. Um, so um, there is this sort of, um, how to say, there is these constraints about how to take that, to how, about how to shape that, indeed. But there was no grand idea about how to, to look at it for, say, 40 or 50 years ahead, no. Thank you. Heng, I believe you had a question, yeah. Yes, hello, my name is Heng. I'm currently uh, joining this session from my, um, classmate's laptop. And uh, actually, I have two questions. The first one is uh, recently we've learned about this um, land consolidation in the Netherlands. And I wonder when they were um, doing this um, expansion plan of Amsterdam, how were they um, trying to build up, uh, impose new uh, city structure onto this old um, polder system? And the second one is, um, because I'm really fascinated uh, with this um, design or planning with the, the awareness of others or, or the awareness of people. I wonder if you can elaborate more about the social political um, background of it and how did she um, like implement this, uh, this thought throughout, like, throughout the scales from um, like the, the planning of the the blocks to 
actually between the blocks and actually the entire layout of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so uh, to answer your first question, um, uh, the interesting thing with, with uh, planning at the time, it was really the tabula rasa method. So also the Amsterdam forest, um, you have this whole system of the polders and it was totally ignored. So there was a big pile of sand just put on top of it. Um, so that was with all these post-war neighborhoods. So it's, um, um, so it was quite a rigid system that only started to change really in 1980s uh, to think differently about how you can keep elements of the existing structure and, and how to use that as a source of inspiration or a point of departure for your new plans. Um, so that's one thing. And your second question, that is something that I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to dive into and get closer to, um, how she was shaping all these different um, different scales and levels and how it was connected to one another. Um, the, the more, um, I mean, what becomes clear through the different articles that she wrote and also when she had this inaugural speech is that she is, um, and, and I think that's quite interesting, is that she um, really stresses the notion of sociology and that we uh, also as planners, uh, the connection between sociology and urban planner is, is too small. Um, so that is so that uh, she said also if I had uh, in another life I would study sociology because I think that's an important tool for us uh, to use as uh, as inspiration and about how to shape our cities and, and our neighborhoods. Um, so uh, she has a strong preference for that, uh, but I still need to see and need to dive into these plans uh, more in detail on how where she positioned the playgrounds exactly in order to see how she tried to make these connections. Great, thank, thank you. you. Javier, Javier, you had a question? Yes, thank you. Um, and, and thank you for such an insight, insightful presentation. I enjoyed it very much. I have two questions. Um, the impression I get uh, is that the, um, Mrs. Mulder was very much interested in this cozy aspect of um, urban living, her interest in um, social interaction, the human scale. So from that perspective, what was the vision of uh, transport at the time when, when she started mainly, because you mentioned something in the 60s, but more in the 30s, what was the vision of, tra of transport? Was this expansion made thinking of public transport or the car, private cars? And the second question is when you mentioned um, playgrounds, it made me think of uh, Moses. Did she ever travel to New York? Was there any communication between both of them? Um, can we really relate both projects uh, um, in Amsterdam and New York around the playground issue? Thanks. Okay. Um, so the, 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 to answer your first question, um, uh, there were notions on, on the traffic. I think the, uh, especially Van Eastern had a strong preference for the, for the car. He actually designed parts, uh, say certain parts of, of the Amsterdam extension plan, especially in, in, in the first phase as, as how you would experience it by driving by car. Um, um, I, I must admit that I need to dive into this more deeply uh, because uh, you can tell also from the way she wrote about play, for instance, that they could not imagine uh, the growth of traffic or say the use of the car that quickly. Um, and that it was a problematic issue also inside the neighborhoods itself, how to, how to also go because they had to, they, they had to be parked somewhere. Um, and of course it was unsafe to a certain degree. Um, so uh, to put that into execution uh, was something that was, uh, was, was a puzzling thing. And uh, strikingly enough, also when I went through uh, the committee, say for the new city, um, a lot of proposals were there for garage boxes. Um, and it was, there was huge debates about them, you know, if they, if that, that should be separate, if there would be enough parking place for um, uh, inside the neighborhoods, but also for high rise uh, projects. So it was definitely an issue about how to deal with all of that material in our neighborhoods. Um, so again, so this is not a, a very profound answer to your question, but it, it was something that was growing through time. Um, and that also in the practical issues that they were confronted 
with trying to find new types of solutions. Um, in regard to your second question, um, I didn't find anything yet about the relationship between Amsterdam, New York, or at least in regard to, to Mulder. Um, 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 so I, I, I would need to, to, I hope I find more material also because she traveled a lot, that is clear, but she has thrown away all the photographs and, uh, and all the different slides. So it, it's quite difficult to grasp um, what her sources of inspiration were. I know, for instance, for the Amsterdam forest, but also for the urban green, is that she visited many parks uh, from Italy to France, but it's it's all very intangible. So I'm trying to figure out, you know, in order to sort of find evidence to see if it works the way I think it works. Yeah. Maybe we can uh, continue on that in a moment, but I would like to ask, Yanina had a question and she needs to leave to teach it too. So Yanina, if there's still some time, you had a question. Oh, uh, thanks so Linda. much, Salomon, for, uh, for uh, allowing me to pose my question. First, Linda, thanks so much. I really enjoyed your lecture. Um, I have two small questions. Um, one in relation to the, the housing estates. Um, was there ever any mention of productive gardens? Because by that point in time, Lebrecht Meyer had all done all those productive gardens and of course the, the Frankfurt. And it seemed that there wasn't really any consideration for productive gardens. So I was wondering if she had well, if you found any evidence on that. And then in relation to the playgrounds, because you said that she was looking at Scandinavia and in Denmark at that time, you had the, the notion of the junk playground, which was popularized by Sorensen. And I was wondering, is that something that you came across this because it's a very different type of playground in Amsterdam that is being developed than this junk playground and which was very much inspired by pedagogical sort of yeah, ideas. So I was just curious about those two uh, things. Um, uh, the productive gardens, um, I know they have been mentioned by one architect and I am just need to see if it was from Tay and I'm not entirely sure, but I remember that he was one, somebody who proposed this, but that Van Eesten was very much against it. Um, so this is something, uh, well, I, I would need to look it up more in detail in order to, um, well, we can talk about this later perhaps, but um, it does ring a bell but it was not something that was well, very well accepted. Uh, in regard to the junk playground, I know that she makes references also to, uh, to gardens in Zurich, for instance, which is referring more to, to the junk playground. Um, um, and uh, um, especially later on, uh, she also talked to an artist who really wanted to work more with wood. Um, so she is trying to open up because, I mean, she, she talked to Constance, she had quite some uh, good contacts with, with artists as it was something that fascinated her um, and that she really wanted to see if, if it could be uh, less rigid or less concrete as, as you can see from the images that I showed. Um, so also in the Belmer, uh, they started to work more with wood and this was, um, but uh, one of the former colleagues told me there is this sort of graph, um, like the uh, Amsterdam expansion plan. It had lots of numbers and figures, you know, that many green for, for that many inhabitants. Um, and also she came up with, you know, you have 100 houses and then you need one playground, is that she did that for all the different types of play. Uh, so there are certain graphs and an and amount of, of, uh, of um, square meters. So that is also part of the legacy. Um, so not so much on what type of playground, but, you know, how to make sure that it is actually happening. But the junk playground is something that I will indeed uh, look into more. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry, oh, sorry. Uh, Matthew, yeah. No, 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 no. Matthew, go ahead. Okay. okay. Um, it's very clear the attention uh, Mulder gave to designing in a way which was of gender and the lives of women and families in the city. I was wondering, of course, to design in this way, you also have to uh, look at the city in this way. You mentioned at the start of your lecture that um, the idea of the survey and, and, that, and this way of analysing the city was quite new. I was wondering if you found any evidence of Mulder um, analysing the city in this attentive way to gender and the lives of women. No, I have not found that yet. Um, and um, it is definitely something that I really want to tap into. Um, um, uh, I mean, she was unmarried. She didn't have any children, still was uh, designing all of these playgrounds. So there is this, uh, uh, of course, uh, female um, attitude or opinion that I also need to dive into more. Um, also, I, I bumped into 
um, say for instance, the Wieboudstraat, uh, which is quite um, uh, still a, a very, um, um, I mean, that was at that time, a, a massive street uh, being designed. And um, at some point uh, there was discussion going on if the lights should be turned on in the ground floors. And then she's actually the only one says, yeah, that would be, uh, that would be good because that would increase the safety uh, especially for women. Um, so she has this definitely this opinion uh, inside being into this male surroundings to sometimes uh, uh, push uh, certain ideas that are, are coming from that perspective. Um, and also when she talks about the playground, she does make distinction between gender, but uh, in regard to, this, to the, the survey department, I have not bumped into anything that is leading into that direction. She also, um, yeah, um, when she talked about, was it difficult for you as a woman to be part of this male world? She said, oh, no, no problem at all. It's just totally fine. Um, so um, also just being a woman uh, within that framework uh, was not, uh, at least to the outside world, she did not talk about it so specifically. Thank you. Georgie, did you have one last question? Yes, of course. Hello, Linda. Thank you so much for the lecture. It's uh, really important for us and inspiring. So my question is, could we see a linkage as far as the um, design principles in her pre-war um, proposals to the later expansion plans? Could we see, for example, this, um, this priority given in the greenery or uh, the air and light? the playgrounds in the pre-war drawings as the Beatrix Park, for example? Mm -hmm. um, well, if you look at, uh, say, the, the, the different expansion plans as they were there, um, the playgrounds were not really part of it, uh, at least not at the time. Uh, so this is something that was only added after the war. Um, they were uh, considering a green infrastructure important uh, but how to take uh, how to shape that in regard to the to to the buildings was something that was, I mean they did experiment with that, but the the the, the real uh, and also I think that's the case for for Rotterdam for instance when you look at the the post-war neighborhoods there was something that really was taking shape after the war. So it was um, um, as I try to mention earlier is that they, 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 they knew where they wanted to go, but they just didn't have the tools yet, or at least not the solutions for it. And they also went to Scandinavia a lot to see how that turned out to be as they were much more ahead. So there is a connection, obviously, but it's more of trying to understand uh, how it can be done better. So the Beatrix Park, in a way, is, is not really referring to the urban green. Of course, it sits into a certain neighborhood, but it's still a park in itself. Uh, while, of course, when you talk about the expansion plans, it's really about the parks are the ones that sort of separate the neighborhoods. But how does the green from one park go through the neighborhood to the other park? That's what they wanted to. So that movement, that it would be a continuous line, that is what they were trying to to shape and to look for. And that mainly happened um, after the war. So that's why I'm also making this uh, difference between vision before the war, executing and, 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 and researching by doing, basically, um, within that period. Thank yeah, you. Maybe, I, thank you, Georgia. Thank you, Linda. I actually have maybe one final question, if I can be so bold for this, more methodological. Um, because I think it's quite interesting to write a history on a figure um, that does not have an archive, right? And so I can imagine that on the one hand, it's very, um, well, I think it's very freeing that, right? That there's just the kind of documents that are, let's say, uh, out there um, uh, in the world, which you piece together as a kind of research project. And that's where you're, uh, let's say real curatorial expertise comes together, you know, bringing the fragments together. Um, and I was just wondering if you could maybe reflect on this a little bit in terms of how one, you know, approaches uh, such a kind of, um, uh, yeah, project, right? So let's say we have a kind of certain presumptions here within the academy or the ivory tower that let's say research needs to follow, you know, well, especially within, let's say, architectural history, a kind of there's, you know, there's been the archival turn 
you know, everything, you know, so substantiated by archives. And I just wonder where there is the room to uh, gather fragments, gather other subjectivities, not have to have always the kind of constant substantiation of knowledge by, uh, you know, uh, the dominance of footnotes and citations and things like this, because I think that's part of the interesting thing about a kind of project like this, mm -hmm. that one can also kind of take the, let's say the realities of today, right? Or let's say the bureaucracies, uh, the larger administrative bodies, which essentially have um, stopped, uh, let's say the production uh, of uh, these kinds of projects that you showed today within the Netherlands. I mean, this is one of the ambitions of this lecture series as a whole uh, to basically, uh, that's, you know, without being so uh, blatant, it's more uh, implicit in the call, but to basically to explore, you know, where did the design project go? Anyways, I, I think you get my point here in this. So, uh, um, because you're basically re um, appropriating a figure for a contemporary discussion in, in a certain way, besides doing a kind of a historiographic, uh, biographic, uh, it's also a kind of argument for today. Maybe if you could just yeah, reflect a little bit more on, on, on that. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> well, um, uh, <clears throat> where to start? No. Um, I mean, there is this there is this archive, obviously, um, where all these um, uh, drawings and 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 notes and um, uh, letters are. It's just that, um, and that's what I've been trying to figure out how to how to approach this in the best possible mm -hmm. way. Um, as you, in a way. I want to um, uh, talk about a person, and um, at the same time, I want to talk about this productive complexity. So uh, basically, um, I've been trying to use her as an entry um, because I, I need to do that. Because if if if, if I don't do that, I'm, I'm I'm just talking at large about how the system works. So I'm using her as an entry to get closer to this productive complexity. And before I know it, I'm just only talking about her and she did that plan and that yeah. plan. While it is still again <laughs> something that has been a collaborative effort. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm trying to go in between uh those uh those different ways of, of of thinking and considering so to me sources as um uh, human resources um i've looked into that i've looked into not so much the project in itself because these these projects take decades and they go over different departments. So where to find a voice? It's, it's very yeah, difficult. Yeah. So um, um, I started to look into these notes of the different committees um, that she took part in. Who were those committees? Who were taking part in that? What were they saying? What were they pushing? What were their references? Um, so to me, that is now the thing I'm focusing on also because this personal archive is totally missing. Um, so she was a woman. Right. Uh, who was unmarried, no children. So many people ask, was she lesbian? And I really don't know. Um, so um, uh, also because that would be, that could also be an angle uh, to address certain mm -hmm. notions about her position within the field. Um, so, um, 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 so for now I've left the projects a bit behind and, and really looked into this, this whole notion of the spider in the web and, and how uh, these committees actually were able to shape uh, the city. So that so that's where I am at this point. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if that's a, a solid answer to your question. Um, no, it's a good. I mean, I I I'm, I'm and I, just to clarify, I meant really the are the lack of personal archive, right? Yeah. So the lack yeah. of, that's 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 what I meant in my um, earlier question. No, yeah. but I do think that it's interesting to see how we can, how you can you know reconstruct figures in function, you know, there can be, you know, it can be a little bit of speculation in there, a lot of what ifs and I, and on answers. I mean, that's, I guess, maybe my point that I was trying to make that it can be a speculative project of yeah. reconstruction of a subject um, uh, without necessarily needing to substantiate, you know, every biographical uh, detail in function of instrumentalizing an argument, right? So. I, I think that's what's uh, I think that's what's sort of fascinating about this is you know there can be a, also an imaginary right in uh, terms of uh, uh, the reconstruction of a figure. I, no, but in addition to what you just said, I think um, 
uh, I'm still now in the stage of trying to find evidence of certain assumptions, obviously, about the relationship between uh, Mulder and Van Eyster or the relationship with, with, with others. Um, and um, so for now, for instance, a, a major entry to, to understanding that is the analysis of the, of the urban planning department, which is sort of this economic revision as you have nowadays, you know, is, is, that, is that department operating sufficiently? Um, yeah. So looking into these documents, uh, certain people are mentioned, um, certain uh, developments are, are, are problematized. Uh, and to me, that has been a very important source. Uh, so yeah. I have now found three documents, one of say talking in 42 about the period before the war, then just one say 54 and one just before she retires. And it, it, those three documents really are telling about the position of this department, but also um, um, how sort of the importance is diminishing over time, especially that last document. There you can see in the first two, it says, of course, uh, the urban planning department, they should do the urban green because they are the only ones capable of doing that. And in the last document, it says, um, uh, we're not so sure if they should be the ones they, and we think that they should also look into the other collaborations with the other departments. So this, 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 this wealth of, of they are the ones to steer it is really diminishing over time. Also that um, to me is an in, important, um, well, source of, of, of yeah. inspiration. No, I can imagine. I mean, I also, I think a lot about sort of the contemporary or contemporary moment where less and less these documents document the actual meetings uh, you know, I say this a little bit cynically, but you know, we only get like action lists. So it's never, you know, proper, uh, proper minutes in the sense that this is really, you know, with a proper uh, recorder or scribe writing paragraphs of information. And so basically we will no longer, this is, I think also part of the conundrum of where we're in now is that once things are not documented in those kinds of ways, there is, um, uh, there's no responsibility. Uh, mm. So I just wonder what the future of research will be um, uh, <laughs> when, we, when we talk about um, uh, Amsterdam of the 21st century. Anyways, thank you, uh, Linda, so much for um, being a good sport and um, uh, accepting our invitation and transposing um, uh, your work into the uh, topic of the thematic of the series once again. And um, I think we've all, I've gotten a lot of uh, chats and WhatsApps popping up saying how nice the lecture was. So uh, okay. that, uh, so I think that that is, um, well, that's a testament to a good talk. So uh, uh, <laughs> okay, thank well, you so 